Good evening and welcome to the role of the fourth estate hosted by the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service known to many of you as GU Politics and the journalism program. I believe in my bones that journalism is an underappreciated form of public service. Tonight we have, I think, one of the legendary public servants in the industry uh, joining us to reflect a little bit on his career and how uh, the media covers politics today. Welcome. How's retirement treating you three days in? So far, so good. You know, it's a very short vacation already. There is, uh, as you know, an erosion of trust in the institution of journalism. I mean, th that's true about all institutions pretty much these days, but but journalism has taken a pretty big hit um, over the past couple of decades, frankly. I'm wondering why you think that is? The reasons for that, I think, are varied. Uh, I think that um, part of it is, um, you know, sort of going back to Shakespeare, sort of killing the messenger. Uh, we're sometimes the messenger of things that people simply don't want to hear. And, and if it doesn't conform with their pre-existing point of view, then they view us as a distrust, uh, as an untrustworthy um, uh, messenger of that information. Republican pollsters said recently that a lot of people are looking for sources for, for media outlets that affirm them rather than inform them. They basically tell them that what they already think must be right uh, rather than inform them, which means that you're going to learn things that are actually new, that may, might challenge your, uh, your previous point of view, might tell you facts that you weren't aware of before. Um, so I think that, that all of that has contributed to the decline in trust. And I think the most important thing is that we need to make sure that people in all corners of this country, uh, wherever they live, what, what, whatever work they're involved in, whatever their economic circumstances, um, whatever their race or ethnicity, their identity, that they see themselves represented in our coverage um, and that they see themselves represented fairly sensitively doesn't mean that they'll necessarily like the story or that our, the story is should pander to them or appease anybody or anything like that but that they they feel that they that we've actually listened to them marty i was reading one of the the profiles you did uh in the weeks leading up to your retirement and there was one where there was one quote that i've found really uh fascinating i'd love for you to elaborate on um you were talking about the issue of objectivity in in the press and you said the idea of objectivity it's not neutrality. It's not both sidesism. It's not so-called balance. It's never been that. A recognition that on our part as journalists that when we begin our reporting, when we try to find out what's going on, that all of us are to some degree burdened by our own preconceptions, um, that we and, and our limited life experiences, uh, and that we need to uh, kind of uh, set those aside and objectively start gathering the evidence and then tell people what we had actually found. I think it's really important that we have reporters with the lived experiences and editors with lived, those lived experiences as well, by the way. So, um, and that's why we have to have a diverse newsroom. Um, and uh, that's why we have to have people who come from very different backgrounds so that uh, people can point things out to us that we don't know. Um, as I was saying before, you know, people are to some degree captives of their own lived experience. That means that we need to listen to other people and talk to other people who may see things differently and might, uh, will point things out to us that we simply were not aware of. You know, I, it is different right now. I mean, being called the enemy of the people and, and, and having sort of your entire existence question, the legitimacy of your entire existence as an industry, you know, being the fake news. My view is we should just maintain our independence and regardless of the pressure that's brought on us, that's the, another lesson, I, I believe. Regardless of the pressure, regardless of the attacks, uh, we, um, we need to uh, continue to main our, maintain our independence. Let's talk a little bit about social media and the impact that's had on, on coverage. People should exercise care and restraint. The reality is that they, uh, you know, we have editors when they're writing, people are writing for the paper or writing for online. Uh, but when you're, you're posting on social media, there's no editor, there's no intermediary. That means that people should edit themselves, um, and um, and sometimes people don't. Um, you know, look, one of my pet peeves, and you may disagree with this, but I feel like for a while, at least, it has felt at times that Twitter has sort of served as a uh, as a national assignment editor, right? That that too many people are busy chasing the buzz on Twitter. I think we have to be careful about thinking that uh, what someone sees on Twitter is the real world. Most people don't use Twitter, by the way. Um, 
they don't spend their time looking at tweets. Uh, they're not tweeting. Um, it's a certain kind of person who is participating in that. You have to be careful. That's a slice of America. It's not America and not the world. Marty Baron, your contributions to the national discourse over the past several decades is immeasurable, and we are all better for it. Thank you for your service. Uh, mm -hmm. You have earned this retirement many times over. Um, and we hope uh, we hope uh, we can welcome you back to Georgetown's campus when we all get back on campus.